got over 50 years, 50 years of deal making, probably north of 400 transactions between us. Um, Adam and I, as you know, we're, we're business partners, not only in Dealmaker Well Society, but in Prox and the portfolio businesses that we own. So um, there is nothing we don't know about doing deals. Uh, I'm very, very confident, Adam, in, in making that statement. Uh, we've seen everything. So um, any challenge you have right now, we'll have seen it before. Doesn't matter what sector, doesn't matter what country. Hit us up in the chat with any questions that you have about anything that we do. So, uh, you know, we're here to serve you guys. Um, we're, we're doing this call um, as a coaching call as, as part of my, my crazy 50th birthday offer to join Dealmaker CEO. So if you guys are on the fence and you want to see how good we are live, answering your questions and coaching you guys, this is the reason for this call. Um, I was just chuckling actually before um, when I was, um, just before coming on this call, I was just, we're, we're closing a deal in the UK right now. And I was dealing with some last minute things on that. And then, uh, our, our marketing team sent out, um, the latest, uh, edition of confessions of a deal maker. So if you're not on the confessions of a deal maker list, you should be, um, we're giving out like really amazing free value and content all the time. And, um, yeah, my, my social media has been blowing up, Adam, in the last 20 minutes since that video went viral because um, I posted the video of me outside of my house with uh, with the two gifts that my wife had bought me, my, my supercar Audi R8 that she bought me for my 50th, plus the giant bar of chocolate she bought me for finishing 75 hard because I couldn't have any sugar or chocolate as part of that 75 days. And, and people were like, dude, you're crazy. Like, you're telling me, like, you value the chocolate as much as a supercar. And, and I do, because that, for me, is kind of like the meaning. You know, when you go without something for so long and then you get it back, that has such a deep meaning for me. And, and the metaphor that I spoke about in that video is when, when you're buying a business, don't automatically assume that the seller is only concerned about price. They're not. There will be other things in the psychology that mean as much, if not more to them than price. That could be um, you being that safe pair of hands to take the business to the next level. You know, I've done deals where I, I got out of a $300,000 closing payment because I promised not to change the name of the business. Crazy. But that is what the seller was really, really focused on. And, and the number one skill in negotiation is understand what the seller wants and build your deal around that. And sometimes that, Adam, as we know, is not cash. It's other things. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's, let's kind of get things officially kicked off uh, for all of you guys who are here. So welcome to this special edition of Carl Getting Old as Dirt. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, live Q&A call. So, so, so glad you guys are here. Um, we're thrilled to have you uh, join us and, and be able to answer your questions. Um, first of all, Carl, happy birthday. Congrats on getting, getting older. Uh, it's funny when you mentioned our combined years of experience, our years of experience are older than you are. So that means I guess I'm getting old too. And I don't like the sound of that. So, A bit. so here we are. <laughs> so here we are. Um, but yeah, guys, so get your questions in the chat. We're going to try to get to all of them. Uh, if you've got questions about the CEO program, uh, ask those as well. Obviously, we're doing this as part of the, the kind of birthday promotion. Uh, you know, we want you guys to invest in yourselves. Um, and, and so let's, let's get your questions answered, uh, both on deal things, on, on what's it like to buy a business. I don't know. What's it like to be an American like me? Just putzing off to Mexico for a little while just because I can, the benefits of being a, a deal maker, right? So, so, so the power here, guys, is, is figuring out what the next steps are for you and how you move forward uh, in your deal making journey. And that's why we do what we do. Um, you know, Carl and I could easily just shut down deal maker, go buy a bunch of businesses ourselves, which we do anyways, and just not deal with it. But, but we want to create an army of entrepreneurs and we want you to be that army. 
uh, we don't need to get much out of it. You know, our goal is, and our real satisfaction comes from calls like the one we had this morning, yeah. where we were talking from a dealmaker student, a uh, CEO student from South Africa, who bought a $25 million a year revenue US dollars uh, company. Um, he put none of his own money into it. He followed the, the entire training to a T and uh, it was just incredible to hear him tell a story. And uh, you know, for, for Carl and I, that's an incredibly proud moment. And we want each and every one of you to be successful in that way, to close the deal in that way. And so we're, we're thankful to have you guys here. So without further ado, Carl, unless you got uh, anything else to add, let's just jump right into the questions. Yep, yeah, let's go for it. <clears throat> we're here to right, say, well, guys, head us up. All right, well, well, perfect. So Jeff had kind of a multi-part, multi-line one here, Jeff B. So glad you're here. So Jeff has said, I have a deal where the seller wants more than is generally based on three years of numbers. 2019 was great. 17 and 18 were good, just not on the 2019 level. The seller wants 3.75 times the 2019 numbers. So there's a couple of different ways we can look at the question. I'll let you go first, Carl, and then we'll, we'll just kind of tag team on this because we're probably going to get to the same place, maybe taking different uh, yeah. different, different tacks here. Yeah, so a couple of things I would say straight off the bat. So the, the first thing uh, to mention as well is, you know, don't always get hung up on the multiple. Um, you know the terms of the deal are actually more important. So, Adam, would would you pay five? Would you pay a five times multiple for a business? Yeah, absolutely. If I could pay for it over 10, 12, 15 years, a hundred percent. Exactly. So, if if your seller is completely lasered in on the multiple because his buddy in the golf club got a three point seven five multiple, uh, and that's what he's laser focused on. Um, just do the deal over a longer period of time. Do seller financing and, and earn out. And we can cover those two things uh, for people that, uh, that aren't aware what they are, are later. But just going back to multiples, um, there are a number of things that drive the multiple of a business. Um, you know, the, the average right now in the United States is, is about 2.7, 2.8. Uh, it's about the same in the UK. But there are things that, that increase or decrease the multiple of a business. One is how proprietary the business is. You know, what barriers to entry do they have? What's the size of their profit margin? You know, what's the quality of their customer base, the systems, the processes, the, the people in the business? What I would say is 80% of the businesses that you will ever look at, either through brokers or direct approaches or, or other methods that I've seen a question on that, we'll go through that later. Um, the businesses aren't as dynamic as that. So that's why those, those businesses uh, always have multiples less than three. So back to the specific question. Um, if a business's profit's been growing, you, you really have to take the average because the, the issue that you've got is that 2019, that could be what we call a banner year. What you sometimes see with business owners is uh, they either know they're going to sell and they play full out and get the business as, as high as they can, hoping they can sell it on those numbers. But then clearly there's no, um, there's no real reason why they're going to continue doing those numbers uh, in, in future years. We, we only take the current number of profit if the profit's declining. So if it was switched the other way, if it went from 17 down to 18 down to 19, you wouldn't take an average on those three numbers because... And, and unless there was clear evidence that you were going to get a hockey stick and the profits were going to go back up, you'd always just take the, the latest number. But where you've got growth going forward, you definitely take the average. Yeah. And, and then just the other thing, right? So Carl's talked about the overall valuation. He's talked about growth companies or otherwise. But if you're dealing with that stubborn seller who just has it locked in their head, I need to get paid X amount for my business no matter what. You've got to ask yourself two questions. One, are they actually a motivated seller? So something we talk a ton about in pretty much every deal origination and specification kind of conversation is, are you targeting business owners or business sellers who are actually motivated? And to me, that's always gonna draw into question where the seller of a relatively small business like we target has pegged in their mind a certain valuation. Now, if they are indeed motivated, but they're just hung up on this, uh, you can get around it, as Carl said, extend it over a number of years, uh, change the deal structure a little bit. For me, earnouts come into play here. Absolutely. It's like, listen, I'll, 
I'll pay you two and a half times for the business. And then I'll give you another one and a half times in terms of overall valuation. But that part's contingent on the business continuing to perform well and do at a certain level. And that'll trigger these additional payments for you. Because for you as a buyer, it's a no risk situation. You're going to pay out of upside in an earnout situation. You're going to pay as money goes up, you pay out. It's nothing out of your pocket because the business is more profitable uh, than you would have anticipated. So uh, one of my favorite kind of earnout structures is a threshold method where if the profits are above, say, half a million a year in a business, I'll give you the seller 50 cents on every dollar for profit over that half a million mark. So if the business makes 600,000 bucks, I'm going to write them a check for $50,000 and that'll go up to a cap. Uh, say a million dollar cap or, or some kind of cap in terms of total number, or it'll be uncapped and limited to a number of years. Listen, for as well as the business does in the next three years, I'm going to write you that check for 50% of every dollar over a threshold. For me, those are my favorite types of earnouts. Other types of earnouts are based on EBITDA thresholds where you're locking in a certain, uh, a certain price adjustment for the overall business and it's triggering some kind of payment mechanisms. So it's not necessarily a threshold, but it's if the business does more than a certain amount, it's going to trigger an increase to the overall price. And that's generally a get, you know, converting unguaranteed purchase price into a guaranteed seller net. Uh, so hopefully that answered your question, Jeff. Uh, if anyone's asking for that much money and it's a pretty small business, I would first question their motivation as a seller because that's a pretty high multiple. Uh, and second, I'd work to come up with a deal structure as both Carl and I have talked about uh, to find a way to hit the multiple the seller is looking for without putting you as the buyer in a punitive position. All right. Jeff, I, Jeff I had a really, really quick follow-up. I'll, I'll just okay. talk to you very quickly. He said, you know, do I weight the most recent year more heavily on the averaging? So I typically don't do that, Jeff. That, that's a, a typical broker trick. Um, when you're in negotiations with a broker on a, on a valuation, um, and you tell them about the averaging method that you're going to use, they'll want you to weight the, the, the later years more. Um, the only challenge with that is, you know, for you to even contemplate that, you've got to have concrete evidence that the profits of the business are going to continue at that level. So you might need to look at the order book. You know, if, they're, if it's an engineering company and they've got a 25-year call-off contract with Boeing, for components for uh, the 787 Dreamliner, then maybe you can. But but normally, I'd say nine times out of 10, there's no real evidence that um, those profits are going to be sustained. What, what we see a lot with deals and what we see a lot with sellers, particularly baby boomers, is they very rarely do any forecasting. Um, so they don't have any methodology that they forecast on the 1st of January for the next financial year. Or sometimes they just do it quarter to quarter. And you're business. assuming, Carl, you're assuming, Carl, they even do projections, right? The number yeah. of small businesses I've looked at where, where they've just, they're just keeping the lights on. And as long as the cash in the bank account goes up, that's about as much projection and forward planning as they do. Yeah. Um, and, and that can create a lot of opportunity as a strategic buyer where we're coming in and we're able to add growth through acquisition, through marketing, through sales, um, and through kind of systemization and, and, and really putting a, a kind of a big boy effort on, on top of the business in terms of, of work. Um, so Jeff, thanks for that great question. Uh, one thing I would just add to it is, you know, here we are, we're almost in November. God, can you believe it? Almost November here in 20, uh, 2020. It's been a wild year, but I'd be asking what those 2020 numbers look like. How's COVID, the COVID impacted it, Jeff? Because, you know, to me, that's a little bit even more important than just the 2019, 17, and 18 numbers and what the average is and how you look at the average. Uh, we've got, you've got to have a good understanding of where the business is today in a completely different business circumstance than it was even 12 months ago. All right, so next question. John has asked, where is the best place to find deals? Bizbuysell.com, question mark. Carl, this is a layup here for you. I feel, like you. I feel like you've done some videos about this. Bring me that softball. I'm going to smash it out of the park. So, <laughs> so I, I don't want to. I don't want to spend this call dissing business brokers. You know my thoughts on brokers. Some of them are good, but most, but a lot of them are, are not. The, the the one advantage with a business broker is it's good practice to get access to deals and uh, get financials and to meet with sellers. So if, if you're a brand new deal maker, 
um, and you know, you've not seen any deals before, go into a broker, you can get a bunch of deals very, very quickly. So uh, we, we put a video out where I, I found the deal in 46 seconds. We put that out, I think, over the weekend. So Biz Buy Sell is probably the largest business broker platform in the US. There's about 100,000 deals on there. Uh, but if you just go Google business brokers, comma, location or comma, industry, You'll, you'll get tens and hundreds of broker listings and you can go through, click on their deals and find the ones that you like. However, the best deals that you will find, the best deals that are out there are what we call off-market deals. And to do those deals, uh, I'll summarize it briefly, but we take you through the detailed training of all of these methods in the DealMaker CEO system. Um, but the three really cool ways to get deals, one is all about building relationships. So if you're a small business owner, before you go anywhere near a broker, and only 20% of business owners ever list with brokers, the other 80%, they sell through their network. So you want to be talking to people that know businesses are coming up for sale, like wealth managers, like CPAs, like attorneys, like banks and other financiers. So you should be building those local networks for yourself as a deal maker because a, you're going to need some of those people to help you close a deal, but then B, they become a source of deal flow for you. And if you're getting access to deals that have not been listed yet, they're called off-market deals. So you don't have anybody else that you've got to negotiate against um, to buy that business. Social media is another great way to find deals, particularly LinkedIn, uh, even Facebook. You know, Facebook's not just for posting vacation pictures. Um, I've bought some incredible businesses that I have sourced off Facebook. Um, so just putting the message out there that you're looking for deals, you know, what sectors are interesting you, uh, what size of deals, what locations, you know, getting the word out through social media networks will come back with, uh, with deal flow for you. And then my old favorite, Adams, the, the direct approach. Uh, we always say, do your first deal in an area that you know and you understand. So let's say you're a web designer and you live in Chicago. You can, you can go to Info USA online, access it free with a public library card, and within 60 seconds, get a list of 1,000 web design firms within 25 miles of Chicago, and then just write to them. Um, write to them in a private and confidential way, and you'll get some amazing opportunities like that. So, so brokers is a good place to start, but... You and I know both know Adam the best deals we've ever done uh, of yep. kind of leveraging some of the other methods. Yeah, and just one of the things, and, and it, it's similar to what Carl was talking about with the social networks and things like that. Is is tell people, tell your friends, tell your family, tell your professional network, build your professional network. Human to human contact is more powerful than anything. We've all heard from a marketing perspective, word of mouth marketing is the best kind of marketing. Well, if you're a deal maker and you're trying to buy companies, it's the exact same situation. You want to be in a place where you are telling people what your goals are and what your objectives are. People will find recommendations, connect you with businesses who are looking to sell, connect you with advisors, connect you with people uh, who are going to ultimately help you on the journey in terms of finding deal flow and stuff like that. But you got to have a conversation. If they don't know you're doing this, you know, they're not going to they're not going to be able to help. This would be, you know, our classic tried and true accountants, lawyers, wealth managers, lenders, things like that. But even just your, you know, your other professional and, and friends network, it's, it's super powerful. The more people who know what you're trying to accomplish, the better off you'll be. Uh, you've got us, you've got us as mentors, you know, CEO is the step-by-step -step roadmap to get you from start to finish on a deal. You've got that already in hand. Uh, but more importantly, the work comes from you. Uh, to just tick up a little bit on the uh, the network, the posting, and really, really finding these off market deals. Absolutely. And if you're in the DealMaker CEO system, you know, start with the deal origination machine training, um, so you can build the system, and then and then just go through and implement the step by step training videos where I show you exactly how to run a social media campaign for deals, how to run a direct approach campaign for deals how to deal with brokers and get them working with you instead of against you. Um, very, very important. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's uh, let's look at the next question here. So, uh, 
Um, we're getting we're getting a lot, so I'm just scrolling through. So bear with me, guys. Um, okay. Um, a hospital is closing. This is from ER. A hospital is closing a program in New York City. Building is for sale. We'd like to offer the same services at the site. Staff wants to remain and buy the building. Hospital is the only tenant. What are my options for putting together the money for the purchase? All right. So this is uh, this is if I'm understanding your question correctly, you're asking, should I buy the building and fill it with? effectively I'm acquiring a business as well. Um, like that subset of the hospital. Uh, I think, I think in that case, uh, I see a couple options, probably the best option. Cause this is, this is a service business in combination with a real estate deal. So if this is here in New York city, this is the States, depending on the size of this business, what I do is first of all, I'd, I'd understand how big the, the operation was, what kind of money the business was generating. The hospital's closing it for a reason. So I'd wanna know if it's actually a viable business there. Um, you're probably gonna have less overheads than the hospital had, but I'd wanna make sure that there's an actual profitable business. Anytime someone's shutting something down, uh, it, it, doesn't always, it doesn't always mean it's profitable. Um, so I would check on that first. If it is possible, profitable, has a decent track record and things like this, you can do kind of a two for one. Um, you've got the real estate, although I'm sure that building in New York is not cheap, uh, maybe cheaper today with COVID and the impact in New York City. But um, what I would say is this is probably a deal that's got to be an SBA combination deal, half 504, half 7A. So you're going to need a partner for this deal to help you come up with the capital. So this particular deal you're going to look for a partner who can help put up the personal guarantee and who can help put in the equity injection required because you've got a service business. The advantage of a service business tied to real estate is you could pay for the business. If the bu building is worth more than 51% of the purchase price of the business, you could pay for the business over 25 years because it gets wow. tied to the real estate. So think about this. We were talking about multiples earlier. Would I pay a 10X multiple for a business if I could pay for it over 25 years? Potentially, but imagine if you paid a normal multiple, say a three times multiple, but you spread it out over 25 years. Your, your cash flow is going to be so improved by that opportunity. Plus you're paying rent to yourself. So you got a good double whammy. Um, and there's, you know, there's hard assets in the property itself. I know Carl's not a big real estate guy, I feel like I've converted him a little bit over the last a year. A little bit, a little bit. I'm working progress. You know, I mean, every once in a while, you got to take the sledgehammer and you got to beat him in the head once in a while. It's, it's, all, it's okay. I need it. <laughs> but yeah, so for that, for, for that one, ER, it looks and feels and smells like to me, like a little SBA situation, because uh, that's going to be your cheapest cost of capital. But before I'd even figure out how to do that deal, I'd want to make sure the, the actual services that were being rendered are an actual profitable division. Hospitals don't like shutting things down unless they're unprofitable, uh, especially if the whole hospital isn't closing. Okay, next question. Do you have a checklist when you're evaluating a target business? This is from Frank. Great question, Frank, great question. So I'm gonna answer that question uh, in, in three ways. So your, your checklist starts right at the very beginning. And as you progress through deals, the checklist goes deeper. So the first thing that you should look at, and this applies to every single deal that anyone's ever gonna look at, is the deal's really gotta pass through three filters. So uh, even before you get into, into offers or anything like that, there are three boxes that a deal should tick. So the first one is, and we say this all the time, buy a business in a sector that you know, especially if it's your first deal. So if, if you're a sales guy for IBM, then go and buy a small IT company. Don't buy a vineyard or a laundromat. You know, buy something that you know something about and that you can add a lot of value to once you've bought it. If you want to get out of a certain industry, um, so if you're really passionate about wine, you want to buy a vineyard, you know nothing about the industry, you know, why would you buy a business like that on your own? Because you're not going to know anything about how that business works. So partner with somebody, go find a partner that knows how to grow wine, how to market wine, how to do all the stuff that vineyards do, and then buy the business together. So that's the first criteria is try and stay in your lane on the first deal. 
The second criteria is you want to find a business that's profitable and strong, but has a distressed seller. So you want a distressed seller of a good business, somebody that's highly motivated to want to sell. And those could be, they could be wanting to retire. They could be sick. They could be sadly dying in some cases and not just them. It could be a family member. They're burnt out, frustrated, tired, run out of ideas. They're bored. You know, they just, you know, I've, I've owned businesses that I've just given away for a, for a dollar because I just got so bored of them. Uh, there was opportunity costs for me not getting into other deals. So people want to get rid of businesses for loads of different reasons. You, you know, and, and it's understanding what that seller motivation is because you can then build your deal around that. And then the third criteria really is, um, you know, if it's a business where you're going to have to be making a closing payment, then you really want a business that's either got assets or cash flows or even both, because then that's giving you the financial DNA to go to a financier and say, look, this is a profitable business. It's throwing off a load of cash. There's tons of assets here for security. Then you're going to be able to raise financing to buy the business so that you don't have to put your own money uh, into that deal. And then that should be your guiding filter. We call it the perfect deal making triad. Every deal you look at should pass through those filters. And then you should only be meeting with businesses that you know tick all those three boxes. And then you can go deeper in terms of your criteria. So you want to be looking at businesses that, that do little to no marketing. You might find that's really, really strange. But if you've got a business that's profitable and is only generating revenues through referrals and word of mouth, you know when you buy that business and you plug in some of the marketing tactics that we teach you inside of the program, you're going to scale that business rapidly over and above the solid base that you've got. And there's, there's tons and tons of other questions that you can ask that we, we break down and we go through in detail inside of, of the training. And then the real kind of hardcore analysis happens when you're into the closing phase of a deal. So you, you've, you've agreed the terms and then you have a CPA and a lawyer do something called due diligence. So they're asking all of the really detailed um, focus questions just to make sure that you're buying a business uh, that's safe for you to do so. Well, you crushed it. Uh, basically, the tools are there. Uh, I did drop a link in the chat if you guys are interested in getting CEO. Uh, we'll talk more about that uh, towards the end. But um, if you want to get started on that and invest in yourself and change your life, uh, so Greg from Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, are you guys preparing to take advantage of any post COVID business opportunities? If yes, what business types? Uh, the answer is always yes, right? Um, uh, for us personally, we're always looking at, at any opportunities we can get our hands on uh, as, as kind of aggressive business buyers and, uh, and deal makers ourselves, right? Like part of the benefit of who we are and what we do is we don't just teach, we in fact we in fact don't need to really be teaching we could just be doing deals but like i said at the beginning of the call our goal is to create an army of kick-ass deal makers and entrepreneurs and and uh and it's and it's kind of the legacy that carl and i want to build and and uh and and so we want to help you guys as much as we can um okay so in terms of the types of businesses uh, I, I think for us, both Carl and I are really agnostic towards the type of industry we invest in. For, for you, I would focus, if you've not done any deals, what is your sector of expertise? What is your knowledge in? And, 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 and drive in from there because, uh, because that's going to be a lot, uh, a lot more valuable uh, if it's your first deal where you can bring in your experience and expertise from a strategic level to help grow it. So. I'd flip the question around and say, like, what's your area of, area of expertise? Carl and I talk about it all the time. Stay in your lane, especially for your first deal. Yeah, since, Carl and I've, since Carl and I have been around a ton of deals and a ton of businesses, we're comfortable staying. Well, I guess we don't have a lane anymore. Um, uh, but it's uh, – it's. Did you, did you just get a coffee from the chief, Carl? I just got a coffee and a snack from the chief. She just nipped into my office with uh, coffee oh, and – <laughs> you want to come say hello? Uh, this is I only have one boss in my life. 
and it's my Ooh. wife. She's just come in with a lovely Hi. cup of coffee <laughs> um, and, uh, and a snack. So uh, thank you very much. No problem. See you a bit. Sorry, Hi. Josh is all right. All right. Yeah, my, my son had surgery this morning on his uh, on his foot, um, which uh, went really well. So, uh, yeah, thanks for that. Well, good to hear that. All right. So we've got a question here from Chris. Uh, how is real estate advantageous in a deal making transaction when structuring a deal? How does it question benefit? For you. Question <laughs> for you. Real estate. Go for it. Yeah, so uh, if you guys don't know, I love real estate, uh, but if given the opportunity today to buy a business only or real estate only, I'm going to buy the business all day. Why? Because the business, I can make a ton of money and then just take that money and invest it in real estate. However, when you've got a business that comes with the real estate, it actually gives you even more opportunities to be creative with your deal making, whether it's here in the U.S., uh, in the UK, Australia, any and all of those uh, places, you have opportunities. We were talking earlier about uh, ER having a, a question around a hospital group and, and real estate being a part of that transaction. SBA has a loan program called the 504B, I think, program. That 504 loan program, you can pay for real estate over 25 years with just putting 10% down on the value of the real estate. And if you're buying it as part of the business, because it's got to be tied together, you're doing in combination a 504 loan and a 7A loan, and you can then pay for the business over 25 years. So it's massively valuable if it's a deal that fits well, well together. Then Chris, your problem is to go find a partner who can help rock up with the equity you'd need. Generally speaking, about 10% of the, it's 10% of the total deal value. So if the real estate and the business are worth $3 million, You've got to come in and you've got to put in around 300 or 320,000 in that. But your debt, your debt coverage ratio is so massive. It's so massive. Um, and that's and that's super exciting. So uh, you've got a lot of opportunities. Uh, if you're looking to do a more traditional asset based lending approach, you can leverage up the balance sheet of the business. Instead of using that as a closing payment, you can then take that money, apply it to a down payment towards the real estate, and then the seller walks away with the full purchase price of the real estate as a closing payment. So there's so many different ways you can structure it, and uh, it just gives you one more tool, especially if the real estate is debt-free, uh, that you can really uh, uncork some cash for, uh, for closing payments. Not to mention, you got to pay rent to someone. You may as well pay it to yourself. If yeah. it's a business that, that has plenty of capacity in the square footage, you can grow into the space. Um, it, it can be really beneficial. There are times where I will walk away from real estate. Uh, we're looking at this health business out in California. Um, they can operate remotely. I'm not going to spend the 50 grand a year for rent just to own the property. I'd rather put that money back in, in, in my pocket because I'm not going to maximize the value of that real estate when it's a business that can be remote and it already sells nationally in the U S. So why do I need, why do I need the office space? So even though I love real estate, I don't always pursue it. Uh, okay. Todd's got a question here. What is the ideal seller financing number on a purchase? And then also how has, how have S SBA loans changed since COVID? So I'll answer the second one first, cause that's a, a layup. Uh, the second one's easy. Lenders want more skin in the game from the buyer and they want more skin in the game from a seller. You used to be able to do like a 95 and five deal where you put in 5%, the seller holds a note for 5% and the bank puts 90%. in. Right now, typically they're 80, 10 and 10, unless they're in very specific industries like healthcare subsets can be, uh, can be lower and then professional services can also be lower. So, so in those spaces, it can, you can put a little bit less but the banks are far more restrictive. It's important to know that the SBA, the individual bank you're working with, is the one underwriting the loan. The SBA is just the guarantor on the loan. So it's important to realize a bank has its own credit board, its own lending criteria, its own expectations for a borrower's uh, financial health uh, for their personal guarantee they'll have to put in this. So the SBA hasn't necessarily changed its rules. It's the lending environment from the banks underwriting the loans who have changed their rules. Carl, I'll let you handle the other one, which is what is the ideal seller financing number on a purchase? 
Um, so ideal number is 100%, you know, and I've, I've done deals and Adam's done deals where, um, you know, we, we've bought the business and we've paid for it 100% through seller financing. So there's been no um, closing payment, or in some cases, the closing payment can be just the surplus cash that is sat inside of the business. So let's say you, you find a business doing around a million dollars in revenue, so need circa eighty to $100,000 in cash to trade, that business has got $400,000 of cash in the bank, then you can take that excess cash out and pay that to the seller as a closing payment. You don't have to go out and raise any financing externally. But then the goal really in a leverage buyout is, is to put as much of the deal into seller financing as you can. And the, there's a direct correlation between how much of that deal goes into seller financing linked to the real motivation of the seller to want to exit the business. So if you're finding deals where the seller won't carry any paper in the deal, then that's telling you that they're just not motivated to sell. And we, we know this is a numbers game. Go and find another deal. Find that seller. Remember my criteria number two, go and find that distressed seller of a good business and then you're guaranteed to at least get some of the deal into seller financing. And your goal is, is to build such a strong relationship with them that you can put it all into seller finding or, or most of it. And, you know, the, the thing I talked to you about before, and I, I mentioned it with uh, one of uh, one of you guys that comes from L.A. that I, I bought a business in L.A. called Radio Express a couple of years ago, which I've since sold. Um, we bought that business pretty much 100% seller financing because I listened to the seller and truly understood what she wanted in the deal. It wasn't about cash for her. She wanted somebody that would look after the employees, look after the customers, keep the name of the business, even keep the logo of the business. Her late husband had designed the logo in 1985 and the logo was okay. Um, but because I agreed, to do all those things and not make all those changes, I was able to buy that business 100% seller financing. We just covered her closing costs by giving her a little bit of the surplus cash that, that was in the business. So it's all about understanding what the seller really wants and then building your deal around that. But your goal, if you can, is do 100% seller financing deals. Then you don't have to raise any financing from anybody. Yeah, and, and frankly, from a legal perspective, the the legal side of it's way cleaner and way faster when you don't have to deal with the way bank. faster. Okay, so let's see. Next question here, uh, David. How would you factor COVID into looking at companies' profits? Would you treat twenty twenty as an anomaly? Absolutely not. Uh, twenty twenty is not an anomaly. Twenty twenty isn't just a period of time where we're waiting to get back to the days of what used to be and what could have been uh, 12 months ago, we're in a new normal. Um, or should I say we're in the next normal. And, and what's important to realize about that is, is you've got to factor into the individual businesses, operations, prospects, et cetera, how important it is to continue, um, how important it is to continue to develop and understand the trajectory of the business while tying that back to an actual acquisition, right? I think about this business, Carl and I are hopefully closing on here in two weeks or so in the UK. Great company. They've actually had a, their best year in their company history because of COVID. They're actually in a space that's benefited from COVID. So in terms of valuation for us, we've gotten lucky because the company has been valued pre-COVID numbers. And so we're getting this company at a steal. Um, so it can go both ways. Um, if the company has been performing poorly throughout COVID, you have some additional leverage, but you've got to realize some sellers, if they're not truly motivated, are still thinking about their company being worth what it was at the end of 2019, first couple months of 2020. And you've got to build into your negotiations and frankly, your relationship building with the seller, how to couch or, or, or cover off their expectations to make sure they understand the company isn't worth what it used to be. And in order for you to pay that value, they're gonna have to take a lot more risk as a seller. And that means uh, an earn out, uh, holding a much bigger seller note, things like that over a longer period of time. So your cash flow is protected post acquisition uh, and they can still receive what they perceive to be the value. Yeah, and my, my take on COVID is 
I, I think we're in the biggest buying opportunity for small businesses of the last 50 or so years. Because what, what's happened with COVID, and we saw this after 9-11, we saw this um, as part of the, the global financial crisis like 12 years ago. What we saw is that, you know, when you've got to understand the psychology of a business owner. So let's say they, they launched their business in the 80s and they've had some great periods, they've had some, you know, difficult periods when we've been in recession. And then sometimes an event like COVID just becomes the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back. And they decide that, you know what, I've been hustling for all these years, I've made some money, I think now's the time to sell. So what we're seeing, both in the US and in the UK and, and also in Canada and Australia, is just a lot more businesses coming to market. One of the biggest drivers of deal flow today is the baby boomers. So there's 10,000 retiring every single day in the US and tons of them own small businesses. And a lot of those boomers, maybe they weren't gonna retire for another couple of years, they're bringing forward that decision. So, so what happens just in, in basic economics, it's supply and demand. When you've got a lot more of something available, then prices go down. And, and what sellers are having to do is be a lot more creative and flexible on, on the terms they'll accept to be able to sell their businesses and move off and, and get on with, with the rest of their life. What I have seen though through COVID is, is some truly amazing stuff. I've seen businesses, not just the one that we're buying in the UK, which actually uh, manufactures COVID specific products is, you know, I've seen lots of business owners really thrive through the COVID environment. So manufacturing companies that um, in the UK were, were manufacturing components for automotive and then pivoted really quickly and are now manufacturing components for ventilators and other medical equipment. And they were 10 xing their revenues when the UK Health Service was really gearing up building more hospital capacity. I, I've seen um, physical store retail um, pivot to 100% online, and now they're 4x the revenues and profits they were before, and they'll never go back to being a physical store location. They're making so much more money. So I think it's a testament to the entrepreneurial spirit that a lot of business owners have pivoted. They've changed their business models with these changing times, and they're now doing far better than they were originally. That being said, there are some business and business owners where that owner isn't prepared to think outside the box. They think what they've been doing for the last 20 years is still going to work through this changing environment. In some cases it is, in some cases it's not. Uh, so those are great businesses to buy because you can buy them at a massive discount because they're struggling preparing, of course, that you can pivot that business and take advantage of all these new things. Obviously, anything online is booming like crazy now. We're buying more stuff online than we've ever done. Anything in transportation and logistics is just killing it right now. I used to, uh, I used to own a transport company back in the UK. It was my first deal that I ever did in 2008. I wish I still owned it, Adam. Um, transport is killing it right now. Uh, as an industry because more people buy stuff online, stuff's still got to get shipped around the country from supplier to Amazon to, you know, to wherever. So, uh, so don't use COVID as a red herring that, oh, you know, it's not the right time. It's the time. You will not find a bigger buying opportunity for the next 50 years than we're going to see between now and I would say 18 months, two years from now. So this is the time to really make the hay while the sun shines. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, there's no better way, no better way to get started on the journey and taking action now, right? Um, uh, I think we've heard consistently from students who have bought businesses, they just wish they'd done it sooner. So uh, it's pretty powerful. If you, if you can wake up every day, take action and, and move that ball forward uh, for you. Um, let's see, ER has got another question here. Uh, just reading through it. He's got a small company, behavioral health program, uh, 330K of revenue, 115K of profit, 350K asking price. So it's just over a three times multiple. There's no assets in the business. Uh, and the physician in charge is not under contract, but does want to remain. The seller has made a bunch of money elsewhere, et cetera, et cetera. What do we think about the asking price, owner financing, 
SBA, et cetera. All right, so uh, lots of little questions in there. Uh, the first one is, what do we think about the asking price? Well, I have no idea. Uh, and, and the reason I say I don't have any idea is because uh, with just those three numbers, it's hard to say what the company is worth or not. What I will tell you is it's a service-based business. So you're going to have a hard time and it's a service base tied to, I'm presuming some kind of medical billing, meaning Medicare, Medicaid is part of the billing process. Insurance is part of the billing process. Uh, so you, you're not going to, you're going to have some limited AR, but typically anything that's direct to consumer, uh, you don't really have accounts receivable uh, or any accounts receivable that you could really work with. So this is a service business. The biggest question I'd have is it's only open two and a half days a week. It doesn't, ma it makes decent enough money, but it's tiny. There is a physician who's in charge, uh, but what is your risk? What happens if that physician doesn't like you, doesn't want to work with you and walks off? You just bought something that has now no value. So for me, this is a little too small of a deal for, for me to pursue. Uh, this looks and feels like a lot of work and a lot of more of a job than it is a, is a business. Um, so it's less about valuation, less about how I'd finance it and less about stuff like that. Uh, it's more about what are you, are you getting into something that will be effective as a business for you as an owner investor? Remember, I don't want to work in the business. Carl doesn't want to work in the business. And I don't think most of you guys want to work in the business you buy. You want to be working on finding your next deal, living your best life. Come, come hang in Mexico with me for a little bit. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, you know? Um, and, and, and the idea is right. Like, like I, I can be anywhere in the world at any time, as long as I've got power or I find a laptop, I can run my businesses because there's already people in the business running them and working them. Um, and so those are the kind of businesses you want. And it's okay if it is that health program or that, that health business, I would just want it to be maybe 10 times the size or even just three times the size where it's doing a million a year in revenue and it's doing a few hundred grand on the bottom line because the same amount of work you're going to put into that tiny, tiny business, you can go find one that's three times the size, pay similar, probably about the same multiple, but you're going to be putting real cash flow back of the envelope math. If it's doing a million a year in revenue and using this profit number here, it's making 300 and uh, 350K in profit if we multiply out by three roughly. 350k of profit, your debt service on that million dollar. If you do go the SBA route, is gonna it's gonna be 120, 140k a year. So 140k a year off of 350 in in profit, you could be putting 200 thousand dollars a year in your pocket if you just bought a, a business that was three times that size. That is a game changing amount of money, life changing amount of money. Um, and I I would rather you spend your time on something that's not a job versus uh, one that could be. So for us, generally a million bucks is our threshold of revenue. Yeah, and, and we, we say kind of one to five, one to 10 million, you know, for a reason, because that's, that's the majority of businesses for sale are in that range. Um, sub, at least sub five million, you don't have a lot of trade buyers kind of uh, sniffing around, potentially going to compete with you. And then to Adam's point, you know, really, really small businesses, you, you're just buying someone's job um, the only reason you do small deals is if you were going to do a roll-up where you were going to buy multiple businesses in a particular sector, combine them all together, and then strip out a lot of, of the kind of common costs like laundromats or gas stations or 7-Elevens or, or those types of businesses where it doesn't make sense just to buy one. But if you bought 10 or 20 or 50, you know, we have a student in the UK uh, has bought 73 optical businesses and he's ripped out tons and tons of cost and is now making millions of dollars a year in, in, in profit. So that's that's where you, you do really, really small deals. Um, really interesting question, Adam, that I just noticed in, in the chat, um, which I know, you know this is always a great kind of debate. I'm gonna answer it from a UK perspective and I'll let okay. you know from a US perspective. So uh, Frank's asked, which is a better way to acquire a business? Buy the stocks, or the uh, asset. When he means buying the stocks, he means buying the equity, buying the legal entity, whether it's an LLC or it's a, a limited company in the UK. So in the UK, 99 times out of 100, it's much better to buy the equity rather than the assets. 
The reason why business brokers will try and sell assets is business brokers are in the market of selling businesses to other businesses. And, and if you own a business and you're buying another business, typically it's like an a la carte menu. You just buy the assets that you want and leave behind the liabilities that you don't want. When you're doing a leverage buyout as an individual, in the UK specifically, you have to buy the equity. And, and there's two massive benefits. There's a massive benefit for you because it's much easier to raise financing when you have a legal entity that's got a credit history and it's got all those different things. Because remember, you're not borrowing the money like you are with the SBA in America. In the UK and in asset deals generally, the business is borrowing the money to allow you to buy it. So you need the business's credit history. You're not relying on your own. The other massive benefit in the UK is tax. So if you own a business and you sell it in the UK, the first million pounds of money that you will get, you only pay 10% tax on those proceeds as a seller. If you sell the assets, you'll pay 38%. You'll pay 28% on the capital gain of the asset, and then you'll pay 10% on the cash that you take out of the company that you then liquidate. So in the US, the rules are slightly different, but uh, I always advocate generally to buy shares, not assets. But there are some nuances, especially on Adam's side of the pond. Yeah, okay. So on our side of the pond, it looks a little different, right? So a couple of reasons. The share sales in the UK are super beneficial from a closing payment perspective as well. You've got all the surplus cash in the business. And as Carl was saying, there's a big tax advantage when they take the cash out of the business. Here in the US, I say here in the US, in the US, uh, it's a little bit different. In the US, the rules for taxes, most small companies are set up as an LLC or as an escort. So the individual owners are paying the taxes on their personal tax return. It flows through. So when there's cash in the business, there's no immediate or inherent benefit for them selling the business and not just putting the cash in their pocket. There's, there's no tax advantage because they've, in theory, if it's a prior tax year, they've already paid taxes on it. So that's a big difference. The second thing is that the litigious nature of the US is very different from the UK, meaning in the US, everybody sues everybody because why the hell not, right? It's, it's such a litigious place to do business uh, or, or live or operate, right? We all know this. How many, how many commercials have you seen on TV where it's someone threatening or needing an attorney to sue somebody for something about something? I don't know. I've always seen, seen some of the best and worst commercials there. But the idea is we're super litigious. When you buy the shares of a company in the US, you are in theory exposing yourself to any prior liabilities that the company itself might have, prior customers, prior skeletons in the closet, so to speak. And so by doing an asset purchase in the US, you're able to insulate yourself and break away from those liabilities. However, in the US, it's generally better for the buyer if you do a share purchase for tax purposes. Um, and so they'll push for that. However, all of that's negotiable. In the US, you can typically get asset lending, uh, cash flow lending, SBA lending, even doing an asset purchase. So having, having that on either way isn't a big deal. Um, you know, we're going to, you know, we're, we're able to still get the balance sheet financing we talk about in Dealmaker CEO, no matter that kind of structure here in the US. So you protect your downside from the liabilities. The seller doesn't have that tax benefit of, of doing a share purchase in the US. So typically we like to do asset purchases where we can uh, because it protects us from liabilities. So that was a good question. Um, and guys, thanks for all the questions. We really appreciate it here. Um, let's see, uh, just wanna make sure. Hey, let me just read this thing from Craig. Craig, thanks for, for being here. So Craig, he's done Dealmaker CEO. Rock on Craig. He says, did Dealmaker CEO, it's a great course. He signed a heads of terms for his first deal for an online oh, well and distributor. Yeah, nice job. The business posted great results during COVID. Seller wanted more. Craig agreed to more and re-signed re the heads of terms, have entered due diligence. Uh, and uh, Neil from TML is doing the funding. We know Neil. Um, and it seems all the power is with the seller. I made the mistake of res resorting to concluding with only one company in South 
Hampton, I'm not really sure what you're saying there. Should I consider a plan B for acquisition uh, at this late stage or keep pushing through? Two things. One, feels a little like deal heat. First of all, awesome to get yeah. to this point. But if you're already having significant doubts, just make sure you check yourself. Step back a little bit. Carl and I have talked about deal heat quite a bit. Um, it can lead you to make emotional decisions as opposed to practical ones. If the deal is no longer a good deal for you as a buyer, walk away, walk away. It is never worth closing on a deal just to close on it. If it's not a good deal for you. Yeah. Now, I know, I, I know, I know you guys see it on my emails and, and you, you've seen me say it on, on lives and things like this. You're only one deal away from changing your life. And our goal is to help you get there. That's why we do what we do, but it can set you back if that one deal is detrimental to you because it doesn't have the cash flow. It can't meet the bank covenants. It can't do what it needs to do, operate post acquisition. Yeah. So what I would highly consider is you just take a day, clear your mind, Craig, take a deep breath and say, is this deal still a deal worth doing? You've already upped the price. Um, so I would just, I would take that step back and take the, the big breath. If you find it is, um, uh, let's see, if you find it is still worthwhile doing, then obviously continue down the path. When you say plan B acquisition at this late stage, the question I would have for you is, uh, are you talking about another company? Are you talking about this company? I, I can't tell what you mean by plan B acquisition. Yeah, I think what he's saying, Adam, is, is he's, he's got this one deal and he's laser focused on laser focused on this one deal. Yep. Okay. It sounds like an interesting deal. I think, you know, permission to coach you, Craig, very quickly. This is a numbers game. So you need to have multiple deals in your funnel. And, and I'll tell you why. It changes your entire psychology when it comes to negotiation. And, and I, I learned this lesson as a young man in, in the nightclubs of the UK when I, when I was a teenager. You know, if I was laser focused on, on just, you know, dancing with one girl, um, I would often fail because I didn't have any other options. And when there were four or five girls on the dance floor that I really liked, um, you know, I was kind of almost guaranteed uh, to buy a drink for one of them because if one didn't like me or one didn't work, I had lots of other options. And it's the same when you're doing deals, you need multiple deals because if you've got other deals in your pipeline, your entire psychology will change when it comes to negotiation. I've been guilty of deal heat before. Uh, I totally fell in love with a business. Adam, you did as well, that we, we tried to close last year and we were so in love with it. Uh, we kept agreeing to the changes, agreeing to the changes because we didn't have another business in that sector that we were gonna buy. And in the end, we walked away from it and it was the smart thing to do. So having backup deals, having a plan B is always, always, always something that, uh, that, that you should have. Never just pick one deal and play full out to get that deal closed because you'll, you'll bend the rules in some way to get it across the line. It might still be a great deal and, and be profitable for you, but having those backup options available to you is a really, really smart thing to do. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so uh, let's see here. Just make sure we're getting uh, questions here. Um, how do you avoid the personal guarantee and cash injection that all asset-based lenders ask about? It's a layup for you, Carl. So I typically find that as a, as a red herring. So first thing I would say is if it's a UK deal, there's a massive insurance market for personal guarantees, which is why asset-based lenders are now asking for PGs on some deals in the UK, because they know they can sell you the insurance policy or sell the business insurance policy, which, which covers your risk. If you're buying deals in, in both UK and the US, even Canada and Australia, most of the time, you can negotiate out of signing a, a personal guarantee. So I was looking at a deal the other day where the, um, the, the financing for this deal was through the accounts receivables or, or trade debtors in the UK. So if you're financing accounts receivables, the lender is going to give you on average 80% of the value of the invoice book. And then what they're doing is they're insuring that debt against the credit um, status of those customers. So when they ask you for personal guarantee, 
you just got to ask why. So, you know, why, why do I need to sign a personal guarantee on the asset-based lending? You're lending me a percentage of the liquidation value of that asset so that if, for whatever reason, the business doesn't work, you can seize that asset and you can sell it very quickly and get your money back. You know, why, you know, why do I have to sign a personal guarantee? So nine times out of 10, you'll be able to, uh, to negotiate out of that. The only time you'll, you'll not be able to do that is if you're doing an SBA deal. So if you're doing an SBA deal, you are personally borrowing the money to buy the business and they will ask you for a personal guarantee. And if you don't want to sign a personal guarantee and or you don't have the 10% capital to put into the deal, then you've just got to go and partner with somebody that, that's prepared to, to do that. And you might end up giving 50% of the business away for that privilege. But it's better to own 50% of the business you wouldn't have normally bought rather than 100% of nothing. Couldn't agree more. I'd always rather own a piece of something than nothing. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Um, so we've answered that. Um, for identifying the cash flow of the business, do you use the EBITDA or the adjusted EBITDA? Well, let's talk about what those two numbers are. So oh, EBITDA. adjusted EBITDA. So, yeah, so, so adjusted yeah. EBITDA is, um, this is something you got to be really careful of. So if you're dealing with a business broker, they will tell you what the profit was, and then they will have all of these add backs. They'll add back like the owner's salary. They'll add back lots of other different things that they believe uh, you know, are not important to the business going forward. So inside of the CEO training, I show you exactly how to deal with that and how to negotiate against it. Because you can't buy a business where the owner's salary is being added back because you know, you or a GM is going to have to go in and run that business going forward. So let's say you buy a business and, you know, the annual cost of a GM for that company is, say, $100,000. If the owner has been taking $600,000 a year out of that business in salary, then you can justify adding some of that back because it's not going to cost you $600,000 to replace that person. So, so add backs make a big difference to the valuation of a business. Um, we'd be on the call for three hours, me walking you through all the ways to deal and treat and negotiate add backs. Uh, luckily, there's training on all of that inside of Dealmaker CEO. So if you're inside the program, go to module five, the deal structuring module, and there's a lesson where I walk you through exactly how to deal um, with, uh, with add backs. But add backs, you can only accept add backs if they're legitimate expenses that are not going to reoccur when you're the owner of the business. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So um, let's see here. Uh, do you guys have any experience in buying a business in Canada? And if so, how was the experience? I personally haven't done deals in Canada because uh, I've never, I don't think I've ever been to Canada. But uh, we've, had, we, we've had a lot of students inside of Dealmaker CEO that have done deals in Canada. I think one of the big points about Canada is it's got a very mature financing market. So I think there's five key banks in Canada that, that pretty much control the acquisition financing market. Um, we had, um, we, we, we've had Canadian, I, I know Peter bought a business in the US. Um, yeah. and he was leveraging Canadian financing because it was better terms than what you get in the United States, but um, so and you've the got other a big thing, plus. sorry, yeah, you, so you've got a big, you've got a big plus that there's tons of financing up there. One of the only downsides about Canada is, despite it being a massive country, there are not a lot of businesses there. There's only about 30 million businesses in Canada, so obviously there's not a lot of businesses for sale. Versus like the U.S., where you know, there are millions of businesses for sales. It's just a smaller market. But one thing you say there, right? So John, who's uh, our lead, our lead, uh, lead coach with, with Carl and I on the Dealmaker Academy program, he's, uh, he's Canadian. He's, over the course of his dealmaking career, has worked on a tremendous amount of Canadian deals. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of opportunities still in Canada. Um, uh, but 
as as Carl and I have kind of talked about before, you know, our major areas of focus for when we're buying businesses are the UK, the US, Canada, and Australia. Those four those four markets are our primary, uh, which is, which is great. Um, let's see here. Uh, so Constantine, you asked, where do we find businesses for sale? We covered that a little bit early. The laser fast recap is this, go buy DealMaker CEO because there is a ton of methods that are delved into. We tell you how to network. We tell you how to, uh, we tell you how to do all of that stuff. Um, uh, your second question there, uh, is there a Facebook group meant to help after buying the DealMaker CEO? The answer is yes. Uh, for DealMaker CEO, You've got access to a, a closed Facebook group exclusive to anyone who's bought DealMaker CEO. Uh, and as part of that, you know, when you buy DealMaker CEO, it's a lifetime access program. You're getting CEO for life. If we update it, we modify it, you get it. Um, the Facebook group, you get access to it. Um, and, and, and for us, it's a great incubator of people to find, uh, for people to find um, uh, potential partners to work with people to actually work together. Um, and then Carl and I are obviously active there as well, answering questions and things like that uh, as we see them and have the opportunity to do so. Um, so it really creates a powerful community of people who are elevated in their deal-making journey, right? So if someone's at the deal-maker CEO level, they're speaking the same language because they've gone through the course. They're speaking the same level of mindset and pursuit of improving their life and where they want to be in life. And so everyone's in the exact same kind of space and, and motivation. So it's a really powerful place to be. Um, it's amazing, Adam, isn't it? Inside of the Facebook group, you know, it's all about accountability. That there's people in there that have done loads of deals. So, you know, there's, there's people, it, it's easy for Adam and I to coach you guys because we've done so many deals. You know, we, we know we can do stuff in our sleep, but what's really interesting when you're in the, the Facebook group of DealMaker CEO, there are people in that group that maybe three months ago were they, they were where you are right now. They've not closed the deal and they've gone through the process um, so they can add perspective and value to you as well over and above Adam and myself and all the other coaches that, that we have in there. So it's a great group. It's a great vibe, loads of accountability and, and lo loads of celebrations. I remember, uh, I remember Steve Rooms, um, he, um, he, he closed on his, on his latest deal a few weeks ago and he was, uh, it was a Friday and he was joking in the group about how much alcohol he was going to drink that night because he, he'd closed this deal and he was going to make a lot of money and, and everyone's there to kind of celebrate and, 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 and kind of cheer him along. Um, and it gives a lot of people that, that motivation and, and, and that experience. It's, you know, just to keep you going all the time. And so what's really interesting, right, is, uh, just want to kind of want to give you guys a little bit of advice. And, you know, I'm guessing that you showed up, some of you are already in the DealMaker CEO uh, program and thank you for your great comments in the chat. But for those of you that aren't and you're considering coming into the program, I just want to give you just one little piece of advice. You know, listen to your gut. And I'll tell you why I say that. You know, 12 years ago, you know, I listened to my gut when I walked away from HP and a million dollars of stock options and bonuses to become a deal maker in my own right. And then five years ago to become a coach to all you wonderful people. And if I thought I've listened to my gut 12 years ago and I'd have stayed at HP, I wouldn't have the lifestyle that I have now. I wouldn't have created the wealth that I have now. I wouldn't be this happy, fulfilled you know, person living you know my best life i'd have been fat and miserable the, the chain smoking alcoholic you know that i was back then so i'm really glad that i listened to my gut because listening to my gut back then i, I calculated the other day has saved me nearly forty thousand hours of having to work painstakingly for other people making other people wealthy and lining their pockets. And, and it's easily generated eight figures of, of wealth creation for me over the last 12 to 13 years because, you know, I listen to my gut. And, you know, I, I get it. You know, some of you people are on the Confessions of a Deal Maker newsletter. Some of you people um, will, might be customers of Launchpad, the, the kind of starter 
course that, that we have. And, and obviously, we want you guys to go deeper with us. We want you guys to invest your, your time and your energy into going deeper with us and really mastering the skills of becoming a deal maker so that you can buy businesses, close deals and, and have the lifestyle that Adam and I have got. And, and, and I guess to go deeper with us, you know, we know that there's, there's a risk. What if this doesn't work? What if, what if you don't like the training? Well, we have a money back guarantee to cover you on that. You know, what if you get stumped halfway through? There's support, there's a Facebook group, there's ways to keep you accountable. And, you know, there were no shortages of what ifs. But let me ask you a question. What if you made this work? What if you closed just one deal? You know, what would that deal be worth to you? $100,000, $300,000, $500,000, it could be more. And then, is that benefit, is that result worth the risk of going deeper with us? You know, for me, taking small risks, calculated risk is and always has been worth it. So I invite you guys to come into our DealMaker CEO family. We've posted a link inside of the program. Uh, it would be our honor to coach you and guide you through the journey of closing deals and becoming deal makers like us. And, and living the life on your own terms. So um, the, the offer for the program closes uh, with the birthday special that we put out uh, inside of 24 hours. Um, all the training is in there, the Facebook's up there and ready. There's some incredible people in there to hold your hand and guide you through this process uh, step by step. So uh, really look forward to, uh, to working with you guys and appreciate you joining the call and um, giving us the ability to answer all your questions. Yeah, and just to, to, to kind of wrap it, um, you know, I've dropped a link there in the chat for you guys if you're if you're interested to, as Carl said, kind of listening to your gut and asking yourself that what if, right? Um, you know, I think about just in the last few months, the people we talked about, you know, Carl just mentioned Steve, Steve and his, um, you know, uh, Steve Rooms where he just bought a, he just bought a business. His business is putting in his pocket more than he's ever made in a single year in his professional career. And he's a chartered accountant in the UK. We've got John who lives in Florida, who he was a construction engineer making 90 grand a year, which is pretty good money. He's now closed three businesses, two in July, one in September, and he'll put in his pocket $750,000 a year off of those three businesses. So like the what if that Carl's asked is, you know, what if it works? What if you become that person? Um, because you actually put the work in and all of those people we've just mentioned, they're dealmaker CEO students. And we talked a couple of times on the call about literally this morning, Carl and I talking to a student, dealmaker CEO from South Africa, who just bought a $25 million company, right? that's irrevocably changed his life. And now he's focused on how to grow it through acquisition, through marketing. And it's, it's an incredible opportunity. So, so what if this works? What if you get to live the life of your dreams? Uh, you know, we want to, you know, we want to put you guys in a, in a place of success and, and that's why we do what we do. Um, and so hopefully, hopefully we can have you guys join us on this journey. Um, do we have any other questions in the chat, Carl, we need to need to address here? Um, nope. I think um, I think we're all good. I just want to reiterate, it'll be my absolute honor and privilege to coach you through this journey. You know, I've been buying and selling businesses for over 28 years. And a dealmaker CEO is my entire life's work. And I'm so proud of it. I'm so proud of the system that we've built. And, and the lives that we've changed out of, you know, that call today with, with Jacks in South Africa um, just really makes my heart sing. And, and to reiterate what Adam said before, you know, Adam and I make plenty enough money buying our own businesses and getting the cash flows from those deals. This is our legacy. This is why we're doing this. I don't want anybody to have to go through what I went through in 2008, where I almost missed the birth of my son because I was hustling away doing deals for other people. I don't want that for anybody. I know the pain and suffering that it can cause being trapped in, in a job that you hate, that's not giving you the control that you need in your life. And that is why I built Dealmaker CEO, is to free people from that pain and suffering, because I 
I'd been through it myself. So let me tell you what you need to truly be successful in this program. You need an open mind. You need to develop you know, a good mindset. Take action. Follow the training. Follow the rules. Take the actions. Like anything in life, you know, join a gym and you don't show up, you're not going to lose weight. You're not going to get fit. You invest in this training. You take the action. You follow the rules that I've laid out for you, and you will absolutely crush this. That's my solemn vow to you. But like anything in life, you've got to do the work. This isn't a get-rich-quick scheme. You won't log in and inside of three hours own 94 businesses making billions of dollars. You've got to do the work. But anything in life that's important and means something to you takes a little bit of effort, uh, and we're no different. So please... Come work with us. Come join us inside of the family. We'd love to have you. Yeah, just a couple last things here from the chat. Craig, uh, I have a bachelor's in commerce and an MBA and found Dealmaker CEO to be a great, really great course. Cannot recommend it enough. I mean, Craig, thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's, it's frankly why we do what we do. Um, Daniel, you thought you saw a program where we could in, you could invest 25k for the opportunity to buy a business with you and split the ownership 50 percent. So that's uh, that's what Carl and I do with Prox Capital Group, our investment group. Um, that's a special program. You've got to be a dealmaker CEO student to even be eligible for that. It's effectively invite only. Uh, but if you're interested in that, um, simply send in a message to to customer service and and we can we can funnel a conversation along from there. Um, uh, let's see here. Sky, are we still offering the buy one, get one free offer? Uh, yes, we are. Um, so uh, if, you, if you invest in, in DealMaker CEO, it's a copy for you and a copy for uh, someone of your choosing. Once you buy, you'll then send an email into customer service for that second version. Um, and uh, let's see here. Um, I think that, that covers it. Really, thanks guys for joining us. Um, we hope we were able to answer your questions and really looking forward to uh, really looking forward to, to training you guys and working with you guys, seeing you in the Facebook groups um, and continue to do whatever we can to serve, uh, serve you guys in the best way possible. So. Hey, I just want to say one thing, guys. I, I love you guys. You've done something really cool today. You've shown up to this call. You've invested your time and you've asked the question. So just by taking action and doing what you've done, you're already one step further down the journey than everybody else. So, uh, you know, want to applaud you guys for that. But keep, no matter what you do, keep taking action. It's really, really important. All right, guys. As you well know by this point, or if not, you soon will. You're just one deal away from changing your life. Go you make it happen. Go make it happen. Um, it's, it's such an incredible, incredible journey to experience. Once you close a deal, your life will forever be changed. Thanks guys. We'll see you soon. See you in the Facebook group until then. Bye for now. Have a great week. Bye guys.